For today's exciting topic, we'll be covering the fascinating and aptly named Great Biotic Interchange, the greatest exchange of fauna between modern day North and South America in history. It's a much celebrated event in paleontological history, and today it represents the single best and well-known example of two previously isolated ecosystems coming together. But to really appreciate how awesome the actual interchange is, some background knowledge is definitely necessary. A long time ago, South America was actually part of the so-called supercontinent Gondwana land, along with modern-day Africa, Antarctica, Australia, and the Indies. That all changed when the continent broke up around 200 million years ago. And for the majority of the past 65 million years, South America was essentially a huge island in the southern hemisphere. However, for a long time, South America gradually moves closer and closer to North America. This was caused largely by slow, slow tectonic movements of the land masses over millions and millions of years. Around 3 million years ago, the two continents had gotten close enough that, with the help of a lower sea level thanks to the ice age the world was in, a little land bridge formed between the two, the Isthmus of Panama. So much water got frozen up in the forming of the ice caps that it was actually able to help open South America for the first time in 60 million years. And that's where the floodgates opened. All of a sudden, animals from both continents suddenly had new and exciting land to explore, and, as the name Interchange might suggest, both North and South American species both made use of the newly formed land bridge. Larry Marshall places the various species of South America into three broad categories in his paper, Land Mammals and the Great American Interchange, to better understand the impacts of the Great Biotic Interchange. The first group were the species that had been living in South America since the Cenozoic began around 65 million years ago. Included in it are marsupials, ancient ungulates, and other ancient mammals. These species had all been living in South America for millions of years by the time the interchange rolled around, and lived in their own well-defined ecological niches in South America. The second group of species are the early immigrants to South America, the ones who somehow made it across the ocean to South America before the formation of the land bridge. Presumably they rafted across the ocean using random pieces of wood or materials, and eventually made it to land. If this sounds really weird and ridiculous, don't worry, it is. But given that animals in the second group had millions and millions of years to try, some weird stuff was bound to happen eventually. Some of these brave explorers were ancient capybaras, porcupines, raccoons, and monkeys who persist even today in South America. The third and final group is all the participants of the interchange itself. It's important to keep in mind that these weren't just animals strictly from North America. Immigrants from Asia and Europe had existed in North America for a long time before the Great Biotic Interchange. So, in a lot of ways, the interchange was actually a global mingling of species. From South America came sloths, armadillos, capybaras, anteaters, opossums, and even a rhino-like toxodont. On the other hand, North American immigrants included dogs, skunks, bears, the elephant as gompatheres, horses, tapirs, camels, deers, squirrels, shrews, pocket gophers, kangaroo rats, skinks, and even peccaries. As time went on, a clear victor began to emerge in the interchange, the North American immigrants. Marshall goes into great detail analyzing the difference between what he terms actual dispersants and pseudodispersants. The aptly named pseudodispersants are species descended from the actual dispersant species that walked across the land bridge of Panama. North American immigrants did extraordinarily well. Out of 47 dispersant species, they had a recorded 72 pseudodispersants. By contrast, South American immigrants failed by almost all measures to diversify in their new home, and a lot were never able to successfully integrate into the North American ecosystem. The Great American Biotic Interchange, Patterns and Processes, by David Webb attempts to answer why these large-scale discrepancies exist. And to that end, there are actually a lot of reasons as to why North America won, if it could be called that, the Great Biotic Interchange. One problem for South American immigrants was that there was a general lack of presence of carnivores in South American ecosystems. When they came to North America, they quickly found themselves overwhelmed by predators, a factor that many South American immigrants never really had to deal with in their home at the time. And at the same time, North American taxa had a distinct evolutionary advantage over South American species. They held a distinct competitive advantage over their South American counterparts. Many of the participants of the Great Biotic Interchange were already veteran species originally hailing from Europe and Asia, like otters, for example. These species had already proven themselves quite capable of adjusting to new ecosystems and had successfully diversified in North America for millions of years prior to the actual Great Biotic Interchange. Also, the wide variety of these North American immigrants may have allowed them to fill ecological niches otherwise unoccupied by South American species. By contrast, South American immigrants did not have such luck when they ventured into North America. 
In addition to all of this, climate and timing played important roles. Shortly before the interchange actually occurred, South America suffered widespread extinctions of multiple species, which conveniently allowed many North American species to slink into many ecosystems and replace several now extinct South American taxa. And once again, South American immigrants had no such luck in their attempts at migration. As stated earlier, most South American immigrants had trouble finding ecosystems that they were able to effectively integrate into. Yet another problem for South American immigrants was the problem of climate. North America does, and largely always has hosted, a large amount of climates in its landmass. While this doesn't seem too important, it effectively locked South American immigrants into the deep south of North America for the most part, a problem which largely didn't affect northern immigrants used to a wide range of climates and temperatures. Equally important in our discussion of the interchange is our understanding of the timing of immigration. The massive disparity between the success of North American immigrants over their South American counterparts suggests that the interchange wasn't as simple as it initially seemed to be. Ecogeography and the Great American Interchange by David Webb argues that immigration actually occurred in two distinct phases, one predominantly South American and the other North American. Truth be told, scientists still aren't entirely sure what exactly causes species to immigrate or not, but one important constant in the immigration of the interchange was that it primarily occurred only between animals who preferred tropical or temperate climates. Northern species preferred the tamer temperate climates, and most southern species survived in tropical ones. David suggests that rather than occurring at the same time, immigrants traveled across the land bridge in phases, when one climate was favored over the other. During times of glacial advance, the world got cooler, and temperate climates reigned allowing North American species easy and convenient access to South America across the Isthmus of Panama. On the other hand, during times of glacial retreat, tropical climates spread across the Isthmus of Panama and South American species merrily trekked into North America. And these tropical forests weren't just useful in facilitating mammalian immigration, they were also essential for the immigration of many species of birds. In Wire et al., the authors analyzed the migration of birds in the Great American Biotic Interchange in birds, and found that for many species, the advent of tropical forests forming on the Isthmus of Panama facilitated their widespread immigration. Ant birds and wood creepers were the two species primarily studied, as bird fossils can be somewhat difficult to obtain for various reasons, and Weyer found that their immigration spiked noticeably with the advent of the Isthmus of Panama, suggesting that its creation stimulated immigration and open opportunities for more than just land mammals. Ultimately, the Great Biotic Interchange was an important event in the history of the Earth for more than just causing the widespread immigration of species across continents. That's not to understate how important and widespread the effects of the migration was. More than half of the species that currently live in South America presently derive their origins from immigrants from North America. But at the same time, it has provided insight as to the migratory patterns of animals and what factors can influence the success and speciation of new taxa in an ecosystem. When Biotas Meet, Understanding Biotic Interchange, by Gary Vermey, addresses the implications of interchange between environments by examining the Great Biotic Interchange. He argues that understanding previous interchanges can help us gain insight into current issues in ecology. The success of invaders, the ability of taxa to fit into new ecological niches, and what effects invaders have on ecosystems can all be examined through analyzing historical interchanges of species. Vermey focuses primarily on marine life in his analysis of the Great Biotic Interchange. Don't forget, until the Isthmus of Panama fully developed, there was an easy sea route between the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. Species had been migrating between the two for years, but the Great Biotic Interchange somewhat rudely put a stop to all that migration. And even though large-scale extinctions plagued the Atlantic habitats, they were largely able to recoup these losses through speciation and invasion. Interestingly, the temperate Atlantic made up for most of its losses through immigration the tropics, by individual speciation. Ultimately, Vermeer comes to the conclusion that most interchanges are unequal in the success of immigrants, but more importantly, he argues that the most important factors in determining immigrant success are being relatively more competitive, defensive, and more reproductive. Another paper by Vermeer, The Biological History of a Seaway, similarly looks at the ability of immigrants to diversify and undergo speciation. Ultimately, speciation and immigration is limited by the circumstances species find themselves in, and certain environmental factors can either limit or promote successful immigration. This paper again talks about marine life in particular, but such findings can be widely applied to species in general. It also serves as a tidy explanation for why few species, around 5%, actually immigrated during the Great Biotic Interchange. 
To be sure, there are still many questions about the Great Biotic Interchange. It is still a controversial question as to whether or not the North American immigrants caused the rapid extinction of the traditional species of South America, or whether they just happened to show up at a convenient time and slipped into the emptying ecosystem. There are still holes in our fossil record of the event, and certain fossils are quite difficult to find due to preservation issues. But that isn't a call to give up. Rather, we should further our research into one of the most storied mass migrations in the history of the Earth. As many ecosystems are experiencing widespread extinction today, it becomes all the more important to learn and understand how migrant species and invaders can affect an ecosystem, and that question will continue to be relevant in the immediate future and beyond.